Hello and welcome to a special edition of Cover Point in which I'll be looking back at the 1994 season. To help me in this onerous task, I have colleagues and former teammates Paul Downton and Chris Cowdery. There'll be a feature on Darren Goff, a light-hearted look at cricket from comedian Mark Steele, and Richie Benno, with Shane Warne in mind for this winter tour of Australia, will be demonstrating the art of leg spin. Now, if this was a year ago, we'd be looking at a situation in which England had just won brilliantly at the Oval, and we're looking to go away to the West Indies full of optimism and wondering what was going to happen there. But did we expect to see what happened? 3-0 down after three and then a good comeback. Do you think that was about what we expected to happen or was that um, worse than expected? I felt that uh, England did go out with some optimism. Every tour starts hopeful, doesn't it? You feel that, well, if, if certain things happen, if we play out of our skin, then maybe something can happen. And, and it took that, maybe that spell from Courtney Walsh to bring home what it was like playing in the Caribbean. That was at Jamaica in the first test match there, where Absolutely. short pitch bowling, again, good short pitch bowling, good quick bowling, genuine quick bowling. And, of course, Mike Allison didn't complain at all. He took it all. Well, that's a terrific bouncer. Yes, he plays very well. I mean, we exchanged a few words in the middle. It wasn't anything that was out of proportion. I mean, he said something and I, I just asked him pardon and he was all in good spirit, good faith. And you know, he said, no, it wasn't directed at me. It was, he was talking to himself. I said, fair enough. And I mean, in all the credits of the guy, he played extremely well. He didn't look as if well, he was bothered about it. He, was, he, was, he, said, well, he said he enjoyed it after. I don't know many people who said they enjoy fast bowling, but he said he did. It was a top five or six batter in England. Um, I had no complaints about the bowling of Walsh to myself. I think in Test Match Cricket you've got to have the temperament and the technique to cope with fast bowling. That's out, got in! Courtney Walsh has broken through just the wicket that England didn't want to see. And he's bowled in, played on. Graham Hick bowled by Adams and he can't believe it. Oh, that's out too. He's gone. This is a real tra tragedy for England. Josh. But out. Hick to bowl his second over to Arthurton, who's hit that miles. and the glorious stroke as well. All timing from Jimmy Adams, so he gets into the act as well. I knew before the game that Ambi was struggling a little bit, so I think it was in the back of my head that I had this to pull out the stops because normally when he's fit and flowing, we were, you know, more balanced, but he was, he was struggling a lot. and. I, I just figured out if I could do a good performance on that Sunday evening, it would have been a good chance of winning the game. That's it. Eventually, the Yorker takes its toll. Courtney Walsh, after some fierce and fast bowling, has bowled Devon Malcolm. And he's out leg before. So Walsh has struck again. England in real trouble as Ram Prakash goes leg before. Forward, that's the key. Super shot. Well, that's gone for four. It very nearly killed short leg. Pulled away by Smith. Two bounces, four. Kenny Benjamin, the bowler. Is that it? It's through the gap. Ambrose is after it. He'll certainly look to come back for two, and he's coming back for it, and that is the hundred. Well batted, Michael Atherton. I think going to Guyana, we're always concerned that depending on the wicket, it could be a flat one. It might, it's going to be hard work, but you know, if you score heavily there, you might be in a chance of winning. And I think once we got the runs on the board, we knew that we could put England under pressure. Pulled away. Top quality batting. And he can hit the on drive. And talking of on drives, there's one off the spinner from Jimmy Adams. That's it this time. Full toss from Salisbury. Adams puts it away. The first thing he acknowledges are his teammates in the dressing room. And bold it is. 
bowlers. Their bowlers have a knack of, of extracting anything out of a wicket that, that, is, that is there, anything sort of variable. Um, and they bowled very well. Um, and it, it was, wasn't quite as bad as one or two of the other wickets, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't an ideal wicket. Um, really, when you know, the, the bounce was slightly uneven, you know, the odd one kept low, and I say, and the odd one sort of climbed a little bit and took the shoulder of the bat. That's what you're up against when you play the quality that they've got. But uh, it was disappointing because I think it was, at the end of the test match, we would have said that it was a test match that we should have drawn. It's gone. Curly Ambrose has got the wicket. Big edge if we move on from there, having gone 2 0 down, the remarkable thing about the tour was the fact that we came back, won in Barbados, and then actually got a good draw in, uh, in Antigua. Because that was an interesting couple of test matches in a row there. You had Trinidad, where England hit what was nearly an all-time low. Beat by one their lowest ever score. Having been in a good position in the match earlier, though. Well, yes, I mean, that's right. They started the game well, or looked to have started the game well. Dropped a couple of crucial catches. Yeah. And the captain started the, I'm afraid, started the bad run there. But you can't hold that against him. He's dropped it. We had a couple of bad sort of sessions in each test match. Um, which basically sort of swung the test match totally, totally around. We felt we had played pretty well at times, but we let ourselves down, as I say, at a crucial time, um, sort of through a bad two hours. Well, that's a typical ten under a stroke. But then this wonderful spell of Kirtley Ambrose's, where I mean, he just unleashed himself on England's batsman with an hour to go. Uh, on the, on, the, on the evening of the third I think that's day the there. point with an hour to go, wasn't it? That mm. We lost the game earlier in the day when if we hadn't dropped those catches, maybe chasing 120 mm. with a whole afternoon, the, the atmosphere of the game would have been very difficult. Any fast bowler loves to bowl in the last hour. He knows, I don't know, we had 15 overs, I think, from memory. Uh, and certainly having got a wicket with the first ball, when the blood then is up, and we all know the West Indies are very volatile, they're, they're excitable people, the crowd was behind them. Uh, and I doubt if any side in the world could have withstood that particular I spell. Currently, he put more than everything into it, he put what he did, probably didn't got. And I think, from our point of view, that first, from the first ball, we knew oh, well, <laughs> we, we could be in business. And then, with the run out, we figure, well, it's definitely undertaking now. With you know, getting no wicket, he didn't have to work that hard for then. Obviously, we were pumped up again. Oh, trouble here, trouble. This is absolute disaster for England. We actually said if we get four wickets this evening, it would be nice. It would still be a balanced game, but anything more than four, we should win this game. So when the wickets start to come in, we figure, well, if we can get them all out this evening, then it'll be, it would be even better. But we didn't want to come back the following day with too many wickets to go because things could have changed. So I think we were very, very happy to have had that amount of wickets overnight. We have been around with a lot of the great bowlers, Michael Olin, Malcolm Marshall and Andy Roberts, Joel Garner. And that to me was one of the greatest spell of fast bowling I've seen. And that's it. Curly Ambrose strikes again. And England are 40 for 8. And the great thing about this tour is that England came back to Barbados. And it seemed that captain and vice-captain were more than prepared to lead the fight back. Mike Atherton, Alex Stewart, Alex Stewart with 200s in the match, hmm. unprecedented by any England batsman against the West Indies. And that was a, a marvellous comeback, and that really was a top, a top but, test match. But these, a very are, leading, good test match these are experienced players now, aren't they? Alex Stewart and Mike Atherton, they're the people who've got to do it. If you're not going to take the, uh, the big boys, the, the, the three Gs, uh, you've got to look to those two to do it. If they don't do it, then really you're, you're looking at, you're relying on youngsters to do well in the Caribbean. Now, I can't remember too many youngsters ever doing that. I think the fact that they did come back wasn't just down to Alex Stewart and Mike Atherton. It was down to the performance of a few youngsters as well. And as you said, it was, it was incredible well, how they did Well, in Barbados, because they had runs on the board. And that was, yeah, again, I Richard Richardson had this wonderful knack of winning the toss <laughs> and doing exactly the wrong thing every time. <laughs> yes, and it worked. Well, it the first three times. <laughs> yeah. It worked wonderfully. Yeah. And then in Barbados, where he really should have batted, but probably went on the fact that Barbados is a pitch you always think there's something going to be there's going to be something in there at the start of the game. You think, well, I we think stick them in. I think what he thought was was there at the beginning of the game was England's batting. This is the time to bowl at them yeah. straight away again. Yeah. Athers had a quiet word with everyone, just saying that obviously it hadn't been a happy hunting ground for touring sides in the past. Um, and he said, well, there's no reason why we couldn't change that. And he said that at the start, um, won the toss, went out there and batted as he had spoken the night before. 
and got us off to a great start and it just went from there. We played well through all five days really, which is what you have to do to beat the West Indies. You can't lapse at any stage um, and that was possibly the first game where we had played well continually. We batted well and, and we bowled well for say, the whole length of the game. Well, that shows great character to come back. I think we were surprised, you know, to be honest with you, we were surprised. We were probably celebrating a little bit. We weren't as pumped up as we were for the previous test. We knew we had won the series. We didn't get complacent. We wanted to win all the test matches if possible. They got the start that they wanted, was able then to build on the foundation, which they did. And you know, their bowlers had something to bowl for probably for the first time in the tour. They figured, well, if we bowl well here, we could win the game. And they all got stuck into it and did the job well. Oh, that's through. He's got him. He's always as consistent as ever. He came out there, started with Nagos, and does his bit the way he does his best. And I mean, he got the breakthrough for them, the vital ones, and they were just on a roll from there. Fraser struck again. I thought Torpy played extremely well in that game. He sort of accelerated for them at the right time. Stewie played extremely well. And there it is! Alex Stewart has become the first Englishman to score a century in each innings of a Test match against the West Indies. He's out. West Indies have lost the wicket. I thought Caddy came in into that game as well and bowled extremely well. Barring that he had injured previous to some of the test matches and you weren't playing regularly to come in and he, he put up a very good performance as well. And he's gone this time. Ramprakash makes no mistake. Now that's high in the air, this could go. And he does! They came back at us and they outplayed us over the five days and truly deserve, deserve to win that test match because it was one of them test matches where we could have got back in, but we just didn't get back in. All credit to the guys that came out and played positive cricket. And that's it. All over. And England have beaten the West Indies here at Kensington Oval by 208 runs. Lara, 369 not out. What a moment for him. What a moment for West Indies cricket. In amongst it all, of course, there was that um, magic 375 in the last test match of the series at Antigua there from Brian Lara. And a man who we've been watching all through the series plunder runs from England's bowling. The remarkable thing about Brian Lara was that uh, uh, at some stage during that early part of the tour, he wasn't just talking about taking hundreds or even double hundreds. Mm. He said he thought he might have a triple hundred in him. Now, for any <laughs> test match batsman to be talking in those terms, to actually say it publicly, I mean, shows the confidence of the guy, but also gives you some idea into his character. I think it was the first task I've won and smiled while we did it. And when I got into the dressing room, there was a big roar because Richie had won the toss in Barbados and we thought we, should, we were going to bat and England went in so the guy said oh yes this is it well, we're going to bat for days now and you know when we, when we went out batting we were two down early and I thought mm, what's happening here and then Brian came in and Jimmy supported him well Keith supported him well and Chandra Paul and he just went on to break all records so it was a nice feeling to know that it happened in you just as a captain and you actually did something by winning the toss. His temperament as a young man is like Vivi doesn't want to get out and he wants to dominate the bowling, which was similar to Vivi. He wanted to be in charge, he wants to make sure that he's in control. I think once he was not out overnight, that first year, we all figured, well, knowing Brian, if he batted anything like that the second day, the record was in danger. I mean, I think at the time when he came in, someone joked and said to him, the way you're batting this record could be yours by a closer play. Fraser's after it, but he won't get there. That's the 250. He's a young chap, still learning the game. It's not like he's been in it for five, six years. He's been around playing, but he's, he hasn't played at the highest level for a, a number. So he's still learning. So I think if that's a frightening part of it. Once he was not out overnight, I think it was in the dressing room a foregone conclusion that this record is going to be his. It's there for the taking. It's just for him to keep his head together. I would have to put him in, in the top five West Indians, greats. It would be difficult to say, well, where do you put him? Well, I would leave that for the judges. But I mean, himself and Fifth, to me, are two of the most exciting players that I've watched.
Here comes Chris Lewis to Brian Lara. He's gone for the pearl, and there it is. Brian Lara has done it. The ball rockets into the boundary fence. The new world record holder is Brian Charles Lara of Trinidad and Tobago. For us, batting out Mike Atherton batted superbly, and so did Robin Smith. Um, you know, especially with Athens having spent two and a half days on the field and then carrying his bat for as long as he did, was, was a magnificent effort on his part. Our objective was to save the game, and we did that quite comfortably. I found that with me, the less I think about my batting, the actually better I play. It might sound slightly perverse, but I find that when you're not captain, all you've really got to think about is your own game, your own form, and you can think yourself uh, round circles sometimes. And I find that when I'm captain, there's so many other things to think about. I actually worry less about my own form, my own technique, and I'm a better player for it. For all those that were there, it was a great game to watch. Not, not the greatest test match in the sense it wasn't really a contest. Brian Mara, 375. Robin Smith, also 170 or 175, which was a good, you know, good fillet for him at the end of what had been a pretty dismal tour all round. And so again, if we're looking, at, looking to assess England's performance, we had some reasonable bowling here and there, Angus Fraser with the 8 for. We had batting bonuses from Hick, Thorpe, disappointment from Smith, and it meant that they came back with a new chairman of selectors now, Ray Illingworth, in place, appointed in their absence almost, in, not involved in the selection in September, having said a couple of things to the media while the boys were out in the West Indies, either he was looking for better things than he'd seen on his satellite dish, wherever it was. I think one or two have played who I don't think have given their all. I, I want people to be able to come off that field, look in the mirror, and they can say, I've given 100% for six hours out there. That's all I ask. Players have no need to be afraid of anything if they do that. If they don't do that, then they have reasons to be afraid. I think all the cricketers in the country were looking, at, looking towards someone like Ray Illingworth, somebody who um, over the years has sounded good on television. You know, he's talked the, the, the cricketers game and everybody I think has be, been aware of the fact that if there was a chance that he would get it, that the players would all vote for him. But since he got it, I think, uh, I think I've been very disappointed with some of the selections, I have to say. I mean, uh, you hear in the press that Illingworth's looking to pick Yorkshiremen or Northerners and he does. And people uh, never considered White, I'm sure, uh, in with a chance of selection. Stemp came completely out of the blue. Stemp out of the blue. White, is, 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 of course, is the, another product of the search for the all-rounder. He got five wickets against the New Zealanders, plus some runs. Yep. And so at the right time, he put in the performances, which is always the key to selection. You've got to actually get yourself noticed at some stage. But I must admit, he, I'm not convinced by him. At he the end of the summer, he's been out for the last two or three months anyway. But even during that series against New Zealand, I thought that it was a bit premature. What you've got to do is get a decent batting side, a, a solid number six, and you've got that hick who can bowl a few overs if it needs to, and that needs to develop. And I think we've proved in county cricket that we just haven't had an all-rounder to fill Botham's place. And let's face it, he's one of the all-time greats. Um, forget about this idea of producing an all-rounder. Let's get back to sort of basics of, 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 of having a solid batting line-up with somebody who maybe can fiddle a few over. Now if we can just look back at that uh, series against New Zealand. New Zealand not a strong side, with basically one class player that we knew of in Martin Crowe, against this rejigged England side looking to make a name for themselves. England getting off to a good start at Trent Bridge, Gooch 210, and it looks as though it's going to be a very, very one-sided series at that stage. But you've got a man coming back there with undoubted class, and I don't suppose anyone would have argued with his re-inclusion? I would, definitely, because I... I'm really going on the same grounds of, you come back from the Caribbean with some players who've been battling it out there, the ball passed their ears all winter, they've got stuck in, they haven't had a lot of opportunities, some of those players, yet they've come home and they've been discarded against an opposition, which as you said, is not going to be very strong. It was the perfect opportunity to give three test matches to any one of those young players, or maybe two of them, and actually say, come on, let's see how good you are. And I thought bringing Gooch back was a, a mistake. I still do. Mm. Thorpe, who'd had a very good series, who then missed out, of course, in that first game against New Zealand. Um, you know, you've got to develop younger players and back younger players. And, and I thought it was a strange decision. My quarrels with Graham Gooch are simply on a personal basis and his judgment of players as a captain. Now, we, we haven't got that problem anymore. He's no longer an international captain. We don't have to worry about that. But as a player, I think, I mean, I'm sure he's still, he's still worthy of a place. And this, this coming winter will test him out finally, I think. The man of the series for England was Philip de Freitas. 
again, an Illingworth pick by the sound of it, coming back in, having not been yeah. taken to the West Indies, having looked as, as though he was out of it for forever, possibly. But given the backing, that's one of the great ones where he's been given the backing and the encouragement by the chairman of selectors. And he's had a fabulous summer. He's the only England bowler who's actually managed to get the ball to move away from the bat consistently. And apart from one poor test match, really, at Lords against South Africa, he bowled very well throughout the summer. So I think that's, that's a big plus again for England. I think Ray Illingworth was uh, fortunate that he did perform so well because to leave Devon Malcolm out of the side, he is the one fast bowler we've got in this country capable of winning a test match on his own at any time if he gets it right. And to, to back a, an attack of De Freitas and Fraser and all these sort of medium paces, good bowlers, but not out-and-out -out match winners, I think he needed one of those bowlers to come through and do it. And De Freitas was absolutely superb the whole way through the series. He had the odd bad session, which he tends to do. He tends to drift out of the game a bit occasionally. And, and each time we thought, oh, God, is he, is he going to do it again? But he didn't. He came back next morning or after tea or whenever it was, and, and he was actually the, the great success of the, the, the series. And now, Key, I mean, he's, he's the only English bowler playing with 100 test wickets. I mean, he's our senior bowler, and, and yeah. I think you, you've actually got to back him, and, uh, and, and he needs to grow into that role, and you felt that by the end of the year, he'd done that. He felt his, he was the senior man, and enjoyed in it, reveled in it. You saw it in his batting, he was confident in that. I'm not sure why we can't play at Lords. Obviously, I think we can play at Lords, but we haven't had great results there in the past. Um, let's be honest, they, they certainly outplayed us there, and, and they had a cracking uh, test match. Um, we didn't win the toss, and the wicket certainly deteriorated to the extent that the cracks got very, very big, and Dion Nash um, bowled exceedingly well. Um, I mean, I've never played in a game when, at Lords when he's actually made, somebody's made the ball go up the hill as far as he did. Um, and, and he really, really bowled well. But having said that, you know, we, we bowl on it as well, and uh, let's be honest and put our hands in the air and say we didn't play very well that test match. It wasn't the greatest pitch of all time, but uh, even against Dion Nash bowling well, you'd have hoped that England would have got more than that, and that would have kept them more in the game. We were pleased to hang on for the draw. Um, if you can't win, you draw. To me, it gave as much pleasure in winning a test match that we actually held out and, and made sure we drew. England 1-0 up still and go to Manchester where, again, apart from Martin Crowe, there wasn't much resistance. It was back to England dominating the match. Two days of rain at the end, otherwise England would have won the series 2-0. And I think we'd have been happy enough with that, wouldn't we? Yes, if, if we'd won 2-0. Then the crucial one, the thing was that they at least did save that Lord's Test match. And full credit to, to Rhodes and some of the later order batsmen. I mean, the pattern of English batting you know, just recently has been if they don't get off to a good start, then the, the middle order has looked very soft, and that was shown with those two poor scores there. But at least, and, and again, credit to Illingworth for looking to pick people that can do everything. I mean, you know, bowlers who can bat a little bit so that we become harder to beat, England become harder to beat. Hello, I'm Mark Steele, and over the next six issues of Cover Point, I'm going to be offering a slightly different view of cricket to that which is usually put forward by the people who run the game. So, for instance, the plight of the English game at the moment, it seems to me, can't be dealt with simply by the excuses that are thrown up. So, for instance, when we lose to the West Indies, they say, oh, well, they're bowling too many bouncers, so we changed the rules so they can only bowl one bouncer and over. Then we went to India and lost every single game. So maybe there'll be another rule now, you're only allowed to spin the ball once and over. And then we went to Sri Lanka, who must only have 11 people in the whole country who aren't at war with some other bit of the island. The selectors must just wander around going, Oi, mate, uh, what are you doing later on? Well, I'm not at war till about four o'clock. Come on, you can get a few overs in. And we lost to them. So there'll probably be another rule for them. They're only allowed to bowl the ball once and over, and they have to push the other five down the wicket on a tea trolley. Now, I think that even when you look at how the game began, a very different view has to be put forward to the one that normally is. So, for instance, it seems to me that the most likely explanation is that the game of cricket was being played by aristocrats who then ran out of London, because they had to after the Civil War, went to their estates on the home counties and started playing it for two reasons. First of all, it was an excuse for gambling. Now, this is very different, of course, to the view that's normally put forward that says things like, England in 1326, a sunny meadow and an idle maid comes past, tossing a turnip up into the air. A shepherd, noting the incident, picks up a crook, clips it to square leg and sets off for a quick single. The game of cricket has begun. Uh, I think there's another reason why the aristocrats love the game of cricket. 
because it had a perfect division of labour. They could indulge in the fine practice of batting, while the burdensome work of bowling and fielding could be carried out by the gardeners. And the same happened, of course, when England took the game to the West Indies. The naval officers would do the batting, while the tiresome work of bowling could be carried out by the recently freed ex-slaves, which is something I wouldn't imagine would happen if these same people went to the West Indies now. Um, you, toss down a few balls, would you? I want to practice my square cut. <laughs> my word, this chap's taking an awfully long run-up. What's his name? Ambrose, huh? Bugger it. There was tremendous excitement over South Africa's return to international cricket, and 1994 saw a resumption of hostilities between them and both Australia and England after a gap of nearly 30 years. Prior to their visit to England this summer, South Africa went to Australia for a three test series and then immediately entertained them for a further three tests in South Africa. But Australia were surprisingly denied the comfortable victories they might have expected, despite having the most potent weapon in world cricket, Shane Warne. If there was a seminal moment of the 1993 season, it was the first ball bowled by Shane Warne to a startled Mike Gatting. Seldom, if ever, can one delivery have had such an effect on a series, and seldom can it have heralded the beginning of such a meteoric rise to stardom. His performances transformed an Australian attack severely depleted by injury and spearheaded what proved to be England's downfall in their fruitless search for Ashes' success. They also took him from nowhere to third in the world rankings, but could it last? The first test between Australia and New Zealand last winter seemed to suggest that Warren's Ashes triumph might just have been a flash in the pan, as Andrew Jones and Martin Crowe thrashed him around the park to the tune of, well, one for 113 off 50 overs. But in fact, this minor blip preceded an astonishing six months for the chunky, bleached Victorian prodigy. In the following two tests, New Zealanders were crushed virtually single-handed by the young leg spinner, who returned total figures in these games of 101.3 overs, 37 maidens, and he took 17 wickets for 192 runs. But the visit of the much more accomplished South Africans would surely see the bubble burst. Although the first test in Australia between the two countries for 30 years was marred by dreadful weather at the MCG, the second at Sydney turned out to be one of the truly great test matches. Warren ripped through the tourist batting in an extraordinary spell of 7 for 56 in 27 overs, and South Africa looked naive and bewildered as they were dismissed for 169. And when McDermott and Warren reduced South Africa to 110 for five in their second innings, the century partnership between Damien Martin and Alan Border that gave Australia a first innings lead of 130 looked to have cemented the visitors' fate, so much so that the game looked as though it might not survive into the fifth day. But the South Africans are dogged fighters, and Jonty Rhodes, with 76 not out, steered them through to a slightly more respectable total in the partnerships with David Richardson and Alan Donald. Nevertheless, it was never going to be enough, as Australia required just 117 to win. Shane Warne further enhanced his glittering reputation by adding 5 for 72 to his first innings haul, giving him the extraordinary match figures of 69 overs, 25 maidens, 12 for 128, the best return by a spinner at Sydney this century. Surely this performance had won yet another test match for Australia. What chance could he give South Africa with Australia 50 for 1 in their second innings? Nobody seemed to tell them that the answer was none, and what happened next was astonishing. Farney de Villiers took three wickets in five balls just before the close, and then Alan Donald removed Border and Mark War early on the fifth day, 72 for 6. De Villiers induced Healy to play on, and Cronier produced a brilliant piece of fielding to run out Warren. Damien Martin getting the single. In fact, they may even think about two. That's well run. What a hurry! He's gone! A direct hit! Amidst incredible tension, Craig McDermott bravely took the attack to South Africa and led Australia to the brink of victory. But first Martin and then McGrath succumbed to de Villiers to leave South Africa winners by five runs. South Africa had demonstrated a resilience that has already become their trademark and also an ability to win the opening test in a series. So even when a chastened Australia crushed them at Adelaide to square the series, they could reflect on a successful tour. But if the South African win at Sydney was freakish, their victory in the first test of the return series at the Wanderers Johannesburg in March was very convincing. After honours shared in the first innings, a total of 450 in the second innings proved far too much for the Australians to counter. Hansi Cronier led the way with 122 and received excellent support from Hudson Vessels and Peter Kirsten, all of whom made 50s. 
Shane Warne put to the sword, well, out of that 450, his figures were 44.5 overs, 14 maidens, 4 for 86. Whether familiarity between the sides was beginning to breed contempt is difficult to say, but it was an ugly match in which Hughes and Warne were fined their entire match fees after disciplinary action by both the ICC referee and the Australian board. At Cape Town, South Africa displayed their Achilles heel, a readiness to protect a lead rather than to play positive cricket. And once again, they encountered an Australian side very determined to exact revenge. They potted to 361 in over 140 overs, not helped by two runouts. In return, Australia compiled 435, but no player reached three figures. Steve Waugh and Shane Warne then proved an irresistible combination and South Africa subsided tamely, unhelped by a two-minute wait before Kepler Vessels was given run out by the third umpire. Although Steve Waugh sealed his Man of the Match award with 5 for 28, that man Warren was magnificent once again with match figures of 77 overs, 31 maidens, 6 for 116. Sadly, a great series was to end in anticlimax as both sides looked tired and more than happy to settle for a draw at Kingsmead. But South Africa were delighted to finish with two drawn series. They certainly earned the respect of the Australians. The man of the series, well, undoubtedly the extraordinary Shane Warne. What makes Warne quite unique is the devastating combination of miserly accuracy combined with a devastating strike rate. His figures over the six tests truly tell their own story. 366 overs, 121 maidens, 643 runs, and he took 33 wickets. Add to that the last two tests against New Zealand and the figures are even more remarkable. 50 wickets at an average of 16 and conceding considerably less than two runs per over. Warren is only just 25 years old and has already raced past the milestone of 100 test wickets. Not only is he an exciting and charismatic character, but it seems that nothing can stand in his way of becoming the greatest test bowler of all time. He's bowled him around the legs once again. And that's uh, Shane Warne's best bowling in Test cricket. Well, I think they should get after him a bit. Well, I know that's hard to say when a bloke bowls out here. And you know, I was talking to Embry about it last night. Well, I said they've got to get after him. Well, there's no good planning for the crease. You play him in the crease, you're going to get out in no time flat. Um, I think playing of spin bowling is an art that's sort of died at the moment. People don't use their feet enough. I mean, the guys I played with in back in those areas used to go after them. I mean, their opinion of spin bowlers were, they shouldn't f***ing bowl, they should be picking the ball off the fence. I think, you know, you can't always do that, but I think you've got to be more aggressive with him and, and then make him think about his length a bit more. That's certainly Lara's attitude. Brian Lara thinks a spinner shouldn't bowl and just tries to smack well, him out of the attack. Well, that's right. I mean, I, as a tail ender, uh, I mean, I, I can't bat, but I could bat it enough, but I never thought a spinner should get me out. And... Uh, and that's not because I'm a fast bowler, I mean, that's because I'm a bloke with limited batting ability. I just thought of the spinner, it shouldn't be a problem there. And, uh, you know, it just, it makes me laugh when I see batsmen that are supposed to be able to bat go out down there and themselves when he comes on. You know, you can see them, they're going to get out before they even bowl a ball. And you just say to yourself, they've got to be kidding. But, I mean, I'm not putting down Shane Ward, but what I'm saying is they've got to be more positive. At the present moment, uh, especially up in Yorkshire, you know, I mean, to get a good player in Yorkshire, that's the first, first decent looking one we've had in 10 years. So I suppose it's, it's a bit of a novelty, really, to have somebody like Darren. Uh, all we do is keep our fingers crossed. Uh, I think he has the ability. I also think he has uh, the common sense to become a, a frontline England test bowler. Well, ball. perfect Yorker. Darren Goff was one of Railingworth's surprise choices to play for England this summer. Hardly heard of by many cricket followers at the start of the year, he was perhaps the find of the summer, enthralling spectators with his enthusiasm, both bowling and batting. He's a young lad and he's got kind of all the cricketing world at his feet and he's, uh, he's great value in the dressing room, 
big smiley character and, and he's good for the dressing room atmosphere so in that respect it's been good to have him around as well. It's amazing basically so I got picked for that I got told that during the, in the Glamorgan match the Sunday league uh, just brilliant I didn't know what to do or say and uh, just to put on the one day international sweater I was so proud and uh, it was brilliant to see how he got capped six months early. It was just a great experience to be playing in a one-day international against New Zealand. I was going to only to get one wicket. I wanted it to be Martin Crow. In my mind, he's probably the, in the top three batsmen in the world. Injury then put Goff out of action for five weeks. But on his return to fitness, he was immediately selected for the final test. Some people thought I wasn't fit. Some people thought it was uh, too early, but I proved them wrong with I got four wickets on from the first innings and two in the second, and I thought I performed well. So we'll see if that obdurate man Mackay can stick. He can't, it's all over, he's caught behind, it's tremendous. Five wickets for no runs. In terms of statistics, Freddie Truman's greatest feat to date in a test match. Coming from Yorkshire, comparisons are inevitable, and Goff is seen by some as the new Fred Truman. Cover point got the two together to see how the former great test bowler himself views it. At the present moment, uh, it's no use comparing Darren with me, or anybody else with me, or me with Darren, because two completely different bowlers. I was far more sideways on for a start than Darren, uh, but Darren will learn as he goes along to control his run-up. There's just one or two little technical things at the present moment. And of course what Darren really misses out on the middle is something I had. I had people like uh, Len Hutton to talk to me, people like Norman Yardley to talk to me. I mean, I, you know, I bowled with great bowlers like uh, when I first started, with people like Alec Betzer. You know, I had all that advice out there on the ground. He hasn't got that because don't forget he's playing with a pretty young side. And of course I had a great tutor in Bill Bowes. He hasn't got a great tutor in Yorkshire because I don't have anything to do with the club, you know, which is unfortunate I know. Not too long ago however Goff's career seemed to be drifting to an early conclusion but when his wife-to-be suggested he needed to get fitter and Richie Richardson arrived at the club with some good advice his career was transformed. I haven't really tried to alter his technique or anything like that. I've just encouraged him to, to believe in himself and to try to, to make it to the top. And um, he's responded, and I'm very pleased about that. Because quite often you see a youngster with talent, and you try to tell him to do this and to do that. But I said, no, I'm not going to tell him what to do. Um, I think he's um, smart enough to, to learn, and it's always best to learn things the hard way. He says, you're never going to be a medium fastball. The ball going ball quick. I went in the second team and bowled the quickest I've ever bowled in my career. Felt good. Never looked back since. I've just tried to bowl as quick as I can every time I play. Well done. Yes, he's given it. That's well bowled. Myself and Keith Fletcher recognised that talent the year before, but we'll send him on an A tour to South Africa. And I come back an improved player. He started the season well, uh, and, and we were dead keen to have him in the, in the first one day international at Edgemaster. It's not just Darren's performance with the ball that caught the eye this summer. Since making a 50 on his test match debut, important runs have come from the Goff Willow, and in some style too. Take that! What a flourish! I think a bouncer is the order of the day from Alan Donnell. Let's try and shake up young Goff. Nice prediction. I'm not sure he shook him up. When I made my debut as a 19-year-old, I used to bat 11 for the club side. And then the year after, I got four first-class well, three first-class 50s and a one-day 50. And then next, all the papers were saying, "Oh, well, the next day and both." And then suddenly, I started playing totally differently and trying to play as a bats, like a batsman. And I had two horrible years where I'd never scored a run. And then this season, I decided to go back, like I said, because of. The confidence I gained last year by doing well when we were on the air tour, I decided to play like a can do. And if the ball's up and wide, hit it. The golf attitude with the bat is guaranteed to endear him to the crowd, and his enthusiasm for the sport infects fellow players and public alike. But does he enjoy the game as much as he appears? Yeah, when I first started, I didn't used to enjoy it. About a year ago, I just, well, basically when I started doing all right, I'd, I just started to enjoy the game, and I thought, well, why not get the crowd involved? And once you get them behind you, it's, that's all you need. It inspires you. Top edge. Got him.
First blood to go. The thing that I would say to him is keep trying, but I don't have to say that because I know him, he, he, he's enthusiastic. Uh, the, one of the lovely things about Dagny is he wants to bowl. And the other nice thing, he wants to learn as well. I've no worries about him, he's going to be a test bowler. But having lost form a little in the last two tests against South Africa, is there a danger that Goff will be unable to sustain his early successes? Perhaps the winter tour to Australia will reveal his true potential. Darren uh, is in a learning process at the present moment. <clears throat> there are times when he runs up too quick, and there are other times when he runs up dead right. But it's only a case, you know. And uh, I don't want people uh, come in and put pressure on him. I want, I want him to learn to bowl as he will do, as he gets more experience. The thing is, you can gain experience, you can't buy it. And how does Goff react to advice from someone never short on opinions? Obviously, when he, when he speaks to it, he's never had a bad game, but I've heard he had his, he had his bad matches. And, and when he was my age, he was also raw and went for the 100 a few times. But I, I just hope I can get as many test wickets as uh, he got in his career. And if I will, I'm sure I'll have had a great, a great career. I met it, I really did. That really hurt, that game. I hate even, as much as I'm talking about it now, but I hate even thinking about it, because it was a low point, because I f***ed up. December the 30th, 1982, Melbourne, Australia. Australia, requiring 292 to win the fourth test and regain the Ashes, were 74 runs short and nine wickets down. Well, the crowd were let in free to the MCG on this, the final morning, when Jeff Thompson and Alan Border needed 37 Thanks more to runs run. to win, and an astonishing 18,000 people turned up to watch an enthralling climax. Oh, and that's just landed short of Bob Willis. Well, Bob didn't quite have enough left in him to get to it. He made a valid effort, but uh, it was a foot or so short. Australia 9 for 263. Bob Willis to Thompson. Once again, Thompson giving himself room. And uh, there's a chance for three here, I would say. And will probably take it. Yes, come back for the third. So 23 is now the target. And uh, that brings a smile to the Australian captain's face. Last ball of the over. Border will be looking for the single. And Border has gone. And, oh, and in their rush to get it at Jeff Thompson, who was not backing up. The two Englishmen have collided. That's Alan Lamb and Ian Gould. Norman Cowan is bowling to Alan Border. Alan Border is 50 and they'll be looking for two here. And very well run, Jeff Thompson. Alan Border moves along to 51 and he won't make many more valuable 50s than that. Australia have brought the target down from 37 to 19 this morning. for a single, that brings the target down to 18, might have to go down as a chance, did it carry or did it not? I have the impression it probably bounced almost level with the fieldsman himself, let's have a look at this again, the edge coming there and it did carry it, so uh, that's a chance to be set down against Chris Tavares now. across the outfield but it won't quite go. They then be happy enough with three. Bob Willis to Alan Border. So the ball is going to look for two here and should get it satisfactorily. And there Mr Fielder. And now it's a four to win for Australia. Now in come the fielders. But how many can come in? That'll be exercising Bob Willis's mind because there's only four runs to go to win. Good one ball could 
decide this match now. The crowd know it. Bob Willis knows it. He can't afford to stray in line or length. No one can sit down in the dressing room. It's a question of holding one's heads. Bob Willis, last ball of the over. Can't get it away, Alan Border. Ian Botham bowls now to Jeff Thompson. He's done him! Second time, Tom Ray knocked it up. And it was taken by Miller. Thompson has gone so close. England win by three runs. Um. But I, I went in, when I went in the room, I just felt like I'd let everybody down. Because they didn't expect me to do it, and I, I expected to romp it in. I was not worried at all. And then I made a stupid decision that ball. I mean, I should have hit the f***ing thing for four, and I didn't. And uh, I made up my mind to push a single, and it was just a long hop off both that I should have smashed over cover. And uh, I nicked it. And, uh, and then when I went in the room, I was so down, I couldn't believe it. I even had tears in my eyes. So I just was so let down. Then it turned to anger. And I've never done it before, but I walked in the dressing room, in the Pommies dressing room, which in Melbourne you just walk around the corridor in their room. And I said, you might have won this f***ing game, but you're going to pay for it next game. And that's the first time I've ever snapped after a game and said it to Boofy. And, and then when I walked back out again, I was so, you know, embarrassed then. I got a cranky then, I was embarrassed. And then we went to Sydney and I went right through. And I said to him, see, I f***ing told you. <laughs> The main event really for the season, I think as far as everyone was concerned, was the return of South Africa to England for the first time in a long, long time. Coming back here with high expectations, um, with a reasonable side we knew, and they had a good spirit. John T. Rhodes at cover, of course, the world's greatest living fielder, I suppose we'd, we'd have to say that. I mean, there are some very good fielders around at the moment, and he must be the best. And we thought, OK, then I thought then they'd be a, a hard side to play against. But again, we come to Lords for the first test match, and the Lord's jinx strikes again. Toss is lost, Kepler Vessels winning the toss. In they go. England at the end of the first day thought they hadn't done too badly. Six down, um, on, a, on a good pitch. And yet by the end of the match, it had turned into a, a steamrolling victory for South Africa. And that was a great start for them. And I think as soon as um, South Africa got a reasonable score on the board, you could see the England bats were under pressure immediately. And I think we played as poorly there as we have done two or three times at Lord's, where I think the opposition have actually raised their game. I think that they, they just were fantastic. We had a terrible test match. We didn't play very well at all. Um, maybe you only play as well as you're allowed to play. They certainly uh, were fired up and they certainly played exceedingly well in that game. Um, all their bowlers bowled very well um, and, and the conditions seemed to suit them a little bit more than it did us in the sense that um, they had the quicker bowlers in that game who hit the wicket a little bit harder than ours did. Um, and to hit the wicket hard, you, you very much get up and down and sideways movement. So, uh, well, they, they played well. Um, you know, we had a very bad game. I, you, you think of the batters who played in that, that game and um, between them in, in ten knocks or so, uh, um, they didn't score a 50 between them. And, and, and you look at the batsmen who are high, high quality and you would say, well, that's not going to happen ever again, surely. <laughs> and, uh, but it did happen and uh, everybody chose probably that game to have an off game. A famous victory for South Africa, but something which was almost overshadowed because in the course of it all, Mike Allison found himself embroiled in what can only be described as an extraordinary affair. The dirt in the pocket, pocket cage, call it what you like. The England captain appearing to take something out of his pocket and put it onto the ball, which in a lot of people's eyes is ball tampering or would have been ball tampering. And the question is, I mean, is he guilty? Is he innocent? I mean, I tend to think he's innocent now. I think he, I tend to think that Having had time to look at it, you're not sitting the on the fence there. No, I'm intending to think he's innocent. <laughs> you know, having the the key thing first, firstly, has to be the cricket and the fact that the ball wasn't tampered with in the sense that the umpires wasn't, wasn't affected. It yeah. wasn't affected, and the umpires didn't say anything, didn't bring it to the attention when it was given to the referee. There was there was no complaint made. Are you both saying he's innocent here? When clearly. Uh, he, he has done something that's against the laws of cricket. We can see it on, on, the, on the television. Whatever he was doing is illegal. Well, the so law, the law no Whether you're saying he's not tampering with the balls is just a... Use, uh, no, the, the, law, the laws, if you're going to mention the laws, the laws yeah. do say that you have to affect the state of the ball. The, the state of the ball must be changed 
by your actions to constitute ball tampering. That's how it's written. The point is there, we've, you know, the ball hasn't been altered. Now what we've seen is that the actions that he was using, as put in inverted commas, the unfamiliar actions, suggested that something was happening. I don't think it was more than that, though. I don't think it just looked suspicious. I think it was. I mean, you've never seen anybody taking dirt or mud or whatever it was, earth, from his pocket and putting, rubbing it into the ball. That is clearly not playing within the spirit of the game, which is the law. And he, he was clearly, in my view, guilty. Now, whether the, the problem then came, if, if you feel he's guilty, is what sort of punishment he can have. And you look back over the, over the last two years and go back to that Pakistan situation where even on, these, the, on cover point earlier this year, we actually saw the tapes of Pakis, the Pakistan bowlers putting their fingers well, into the ball. Well, you put a lot of time into that, didn't you? You, Absolutely. you analyzed that, that very, that. very closely. But they were putting finger, their fingers into so the I'm ball, told. gouging the ball, and yet nothing happened. Now, if suddenly they decide they're going to ban Michael Atherton, then they've got a problem. Well, the because difference to me as well is that the ball that started the whole thing off two years ago has been conveniently lost. Lords have you know, shredded it with a, along with a lot of paperwork by the sound of it. And you know, so the office, I, mean, I don't know what shredders look like after they had a cricket ball through them. But it's not too good. What is the big issue about well, this, the tampering thing? We've got seems, a, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, in, in, any, in any form of life, players, participants will try and bend the rules to suit them. And there is a certain amount of, of, of give the whole time. Uh, and it got to a ridiculous stage where the ball, let's face it, against the, Pakis, the Pakistanis ball was being chewed up and clawed up. Imran's come out and said he used a bottle top once. He's admitted that. Uh, and there the, became a period where the ball looked as though, you know, it, a tiger had got hold of it. It got scratched and it got defaced. But nothing's happening to these people who do it. So, I mean, what you're saying is let it keep, it'll keep happening again. No. Just, uh, uh, do you think Atherton carpet? will do anything to the ball in the rest of his career? Do you think the Pakistanis will? Having now it been highlighted... I think will do it, yes. I think if, if Pakistan, if they feel that Pakistan continue to do it, I think the other nations will continue to do it in any way they can. It shouldn't be the captain at Lords again, because I think that's the worst situation possible. But I think it will happen. Mike Atherton has learnt an awful lot in the space of five days there about his position as England's captain. And he comes to Headingley for the second Test match of the series, immediately gets 99, which is as he nearly got it right when he said after it was the best way to come back from that. And stronger too. I think you know, what has showed through is, is the strength of character to come back and make that 90. Um, I think very important as well, the, the reaction of, of the Yorkshire public. Um, the the crowd was behind him yeah. uh, and, uh, and I think you know, he's got a public endorsement. I think most people actually respect him. Just look at that. I don't think I've ever seen Graham Thorpe come out so prepared to play all his shots. I think to come back into the England side and, and play like this, I, I just thought he looked as if he'd been in the side for, for ten years. He, he had so much confidence. And see a player going in and playing big shots, but proper shots, you know, hitting the ball straight, wide a bit off, he was, I thought he was terrific. He came back in there in the right spirit. I determined to show just how good a player he was, had become, was going to be. Who's going to come and show everyone, including Raylingworth and Mike Allerton, why they've missed him for the first four tests? Yeah, not only missed the, the name of Thorpe, but a left-hander. I think, and, and to leave out your best one, and the best one available was definitely Thorpe. He proved that in the West Indies. I think was Illingworth's biggest mistake. It's a great shot. To actually play it head inly in the Test match was. Um, uh, huge for me in, in the sense that I've obviously been brought up in Yorkshire um, and, and dreaming of playing at Head Inley. Uh, to score a 50 there was even more special. Um, but I felt as a team um, point of view that it was um, very much a turning point and we had a very much improved performance and in a way what we were trying to do was reverse the pressure and make um, South Africa feel that all of a sudden they were in a scrap as well and uh, so we turned the corner and uh, we could see a, a win on the way. Well, wow, that's a grubber. That Headingley Test match showed us a bit more about the South African resilience and spirit, because you had the good old in, in Peter Kirsten coming through with his maiden hundred in Test match cricket. And of course, Brian McMillan as well, who had a very consistent series with the bat as, a, as the genuine all-rounder of the two sides. And I say, good resistance from South Africa in the Test match, which they could have lost. England knew then there was going to be a difficult side to beat, and it was something that England haven't done in the past, uh, this, this idea of, of when you get into trouble, battling it out and drawing a game. 
we went on to see a, a hundred from Hick, which again, his mm. second hundred, his breakthrough. But by that time, the game had gone. England's opportunity had been lost. Well, there was a hint that we'll try and win it if we can, but we don't want to lose it. And we'll go to the Oval thinking, well, at least we can draw the series. That seemed to be more the thinking than, yes, we're going to try and win this series from four o'clock on the, the fourth night of the game. So the stage was set then for the final test match of the series. One love to South Africa, one to go. And Devon Malcolm back in the side. That turned out to be the key selection as far as England were concerned. But a great test match. One of the best test matches I've ever seen, actually, I think. A great entertainment. And to me, it all started to go right for England, and I think to most, most observers, on the Friday night. With Philip de Freitas and Darren Goff at the crease. Still was some way to make up. South Africa looking as though they're going to end up with a 60-70 lead, which would have been pretty handy. And suddenly the whole atmosphere of the game changed. All of a sudden, they were the ones feeling the pinch. They were the ones thinking, uh, these guys are getting the upper hand here. Um, and it, it spurred us all on. And uh, there was obviously a lot of other um, elements surrounding that game. That um, and All the lads go out there to try the best every single game. But uh, we recognised so much that uh, we wanted to win for England, but also for Mike Atherton as well. There is something of, of Goff in, in, in the way Goff approaches his cricket. Uh, and he got De Freitas going as well. De Freitas has always yeah. been a much better batter when he's playing shots. And the two of them just had a frolic. Alan Donald, the faster he bowled, the, the more he disappeared. And I couldn't agree more. It changed the whole atmosphere of the game. It uplifted England, depressed South Africa. Uh, and certainly as far as the paying, uh, in the paying public was concerned, then it was you know, as good entertainment as you ever want to see. Devon had actually bowled at the tail enders in the first innings, uh, South Africa. And um, they'd got a few runs off him. We were all quite disappointed with this, and I'm sure he was. When they hit him on the head, to a certain extent, made him think, well, crikey, you know, these lads are letting me have it, so I'm going to go all the way and let them have it all the way through. And he, he went out there with, and bowled very, very straight, but very quickly. The first ball that Devon Malcolm bowled, which whistled past Gary Kirsten's uh, left shoulder as he turned away from it, you thought, now we've got trouble. He's got such a strong physique about him, and the ball hits the bat so hard. Um, and that there's always this slightly eccentric sort of, um, you know, you're never quite sure where the ball's going to be. He's not got a classical action, uh, that he's incredibly intimidating. Uh, he got the direction right, but he bowled at the speed of light. And yeah. poor Peter Kirsten, 39 years old, promoted to open the batting. Uh, I mean, what a disastrous tactical error that was by South Africa, leaving out Hudson, uh, and, and, and making the top order very weak. Uh, and, well, they never quite recovered. Bowled him, pitched it up, got his reward, three wickets for Malcolm, one for three. I remember a few times when he was roaring in that uh, the crowd was so much behind Devon, the, 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 the shouts and chants, and I had the old tingle behind the back of the neck, I can tell you, and, and I was desperately saying myself to, to concentrate, uh, forget about what's happening around and concentrate on the ball, and uh, if the chance has come, snap him up. It was down to one person, really. Devon bowled magnificently. It wouldn't be a nicer fella, you know, if you could wish, wish that for someone, it, it would be Devon, because he, he always gives you 110%. It doesn't always seem that way. He's always got, he's received a lot of criticism for the way he bowls, and I think everyone in the side was just so delighted for him. Um, he did, he bowled very quick. There was one delivery I took off Devon that he bowled to Matthews that was an absolute snorter, and I was really pleased with that catch. When a bowler that quick, actually let's go of a ball and you're a little bit blinded by the batsman you don't quite know where the ball is because he's in the way and all of a sudden it pops up um, the reaction to take the catch I was pleased with it went quite quickly it's gone another one eight for Devon Malcolm Bold him nine wickets for Malcolm we won the test match in the end on, on the back of him, there was nothing else. Obviously the second innings when we batted and, and got the runs pretty quickly, but um, that was all through, I think, just a continuation of the atmosphere which Devon had created through, through what he had done. I also had a lot to do to, to, prove, to prove to a lot of people, uh, well, and to myself too, otherwise I think I would have been on the scrap heap. So, you know, the last few nails in the coffin were getting closer and closer. The South African series, turned it round for me. The winter obviously was in doubt at one stage, halfway through the summer. By the end of the summer I felt that I would have a good chance of going. It just shows how quickly things change around, doesn't it? <laughs> I think over the summer I've been really happy with the way the side's progressed. As I say, if you take out two 
days of rain at Manchester, it would have been three test match victories to one this summer and I think that's an acceptable progress after what's gone on. As England prepare for Australia and Shane Warne, it's appropriate that this month's extract from the MC Masterclass comes from Richie Benno. Here he demonstrates the techniques that made him a great leg spinner. Well, that's a decent start. But now, let's just have a look at, at uh, your grip for a start. The, the whole basis of bowling a leg break is that the ball, as it's going down the pitch, needs the seam to be rotating in that direction. I just turned round to get the red. So it needs to be, the seam needs to be turning anti-clockwise, going from leg to off. And the first thing that's happening there is that you haven't got the ball in your hand as you're starting to run in. So you're just going to put it in in haphazard fashion, which is not really good enough. You need to start your run, you need to have your grip, you have the same grip for every delivery, and you need to have your grip set from the moment you turn to come in there. So it's a matter of having the grip there like that with the knuckle on the seam and the two knuckles there down the seam. And when you spin it out of your hand, you start off for the leg break with the back of your hand facing the sky. One of the, f one of the things you must understand is what happens to the ball on the way down and why it happens. First moment of delivery is when the back of the hand faces the sky and then to bowl the leg break the back of the hand faces your face and then the ball is going to come out like that. Right now there's a instantly all the way down there you could see that the seam was in fact pointing towards slip. Yeah. That's the first time that's happened because you were scrambling the seam it was just going like that all the way down before. If you bowl with your eyes looking over your front shoulder at the batsman down there, then you've got a, a real good start because you are now, in your delivery action, going to pivot and that is going to allow you to spin the ball quite sharply. If, on the other hand, you bowl looking on the other side of your arm and not over your front shoulder, you've got nowhere to go. You can't pivot and you're just going to push the ball at the batsman like that. You can't spin it. I defy anyone front on to spin a leg break hard because, as I say, there is nowhere for them to go. You don't uh, get it down as far as you would for what you might term proper googly, which is starting your hand facing the sky, same grip, in the same position there, no different. It seems still go that way, but it's all in the positioning of the hand what happens to the ball as it goes out. Leg spinner, because it's back of the hand facing the face, it's spinning that way. Over spinner, sky first, and then facing the batsman, and the ball goes down like that. And wrong and exactly the same grip, seam pointing that way, back of the hand facing the sky, and then facing the ground, and the ball is pointing in that direction. So it all comes from, the, it's impossible for you to bowl a wrong and with the back of your hand facing your face. Right. And it's also impossible for you to bowl a leg break if the back of your hand's there. It all depends on the positioning of your hand. Right. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's as far as you, you need to spin it. You only need subtle variation. You don't want uh, outlandish variation because a good batsman's going to pick it anyway. The problem is he's still got to play it. So a uh, small amount of spin like that, landing on the spot and bowled at that pace because you're fairly quick through the air, that I would say is decidedly useful. So there are those three balls and the flipper is the same grip but quite different in execution because the flipper is the only ball that comes out from underneath the hand. The term over the wrist spinner indicates that the ball is going to come out in effect over the wrist. The flipper comes out from underneath like that and it's squeezed out like that so that when it's squeezed out it is spinning around its own axis like that. 
all the way down the pitch and it hits and skids. It doesn't hit and spin away, or it doesn't hit and bounce, but it hits and skids. Right, I'll bowl this to you or flip it to you. And you catch it, just keep your eye on my hand. It's like that, it comes from under there, like that. So, same grip, and it's actually spinning sideways as it goes down the pitch. First 20 times I bowled it, it never hit the cut portion. Oh, very good. I know it wasn't straight, but that's excellent. Like a lot of things in cricket, keep it simple and work hard at it. It was the aim to perfect um, the thing, to be able to bowl exactly what I wanted and know within the limitations of uh, what you were doing that uh, it was going to have a chance of being successful. If we look at the domestic season, there's only really one county that springs to mind, Warwickshire. They've had an all-conquering season, apart from the NatWest final, which got away from them. They've had the most incredible season. Dermot Reeve was the skipper, a wonderful maverick sort of character, great spirit. Bob Warmer was a very good coach, great team spirit, and Brian Lara, of course. Brian Lara, the outstanding player of the county season. Certainly in championship cricket, got Warwickshire off to a great start. I mean, with a player like that on your side, where can you go wrong? You just can't go well, wrong. Well, can that you? was the start to the season, wasn't it? That, mm. It gave them a huge boost. But I think also, I think we've, we've got to talk about Tim Munton, who did a tremendous job as captain when Dermot Reeve didn't play. Uh, incidentally, I felt it was, it was quite brave of him to, to leave himself out in the championship. It wasn't just injury. People said he was injured a lot of the time. But in fact, he was leaving himself out because he couldn't get into the side. Now, if you looked at that Warwickshire side at the beginning of the year and said Dermot Reeve can't get into that championship side, you, you wouldn't have believed it. It certainly had been an extraordinary season for Warwickshire, and Jack Bannister talked to Dermot Reeve, firstly asking if Brian Lara was the catalyst to their success. Amazing player. I mean, technically, to, you know, to watch him and his balance, footwork, and how hard, his, uh, how hard he hits the ball, it's been, it's been a wonderful season you know, to, to sit watching cricket at, at, at Warwickshire. He's a, he's a fabulous player. He scored runs so quickly in the championship, big runs. It's given us time to bowl people out twice, which is vital. I think uh, he's helped the younger players confidence-wise. Uh, I think that they've learned from, from watching Brian. You know, we've got some good thinkers in the game at, at Warwickshire, and the likes of Roger Tews and, and the other fellows have actually studied and play, and, and they've picked up things from watching him, which I think has helped their game. I suppose I mean, the highlight, obviously, for Brian Lara through the whole summer was that 501, which you or I have never contemplated scoring probably 300 even, actually, to be honest, but 400, 500. I go down a bit. I'm more 200. You may be 300. You were a better player than I was. But what a, what a performance. 500. I mean, he got 390 in one day. And apparently there, there was a partnership there, I think, with Trevor Penny, where Penny scored 40, I think, out of over 300. 20, it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite extraordinary how quickly he scored. I mean, it may be a good wicket. The single most outstanding feature must be the single-minded determination of the batsman to carry on. Because that's, that's why other batsmen never get there. That's why other batsmen never make 200, for instance, because they think they've done the job if they get 100 or 150, and they relax, they give up. And yet, for someone like Brian Lara, it seems you know, the, only, the only thing you do is you carry on batting. The guys bowled pretty well, and particularly Simon Brown. Had him in a bit of trouble on the, particularly on the first day. Had him dropped, Anderson bowled him off a no ball. You know, we had three men on the fence on the short boundary, and he still either hit the gap or hit it over them. Uh, and on the long side, he just hit it in the middle and run two. It was very difficult to get him away from the strike. The thing about Brian Lara is the fact that he just keeps going. He's got a, an array of shots that are, you know, fantastic to watch. You know, he punishes bad bowling superbly well. Um, but he's, he's got a, a mental contribution. You know, he just stays at the crease, and he just keeps himself going all the time. And at lunchtime, I did overhear him say to Glaston Small that he thought he could get the record. So, you know, he set his stall out to, to achieve it. A lot of people might call it boastful or he might get swell-headed or things like that, but I hate picking up the newspapers the next day and not seeing my name spread across it. I think that 
it's a lot of satisfaction for me. I like going out there and doing the job. If it's called selfishness, but I like being the number one player at all times. The Botanic County Championship. Did, did you ever really think you'd, you'd lead a side to a championship title? Well, on this, I've got to pay tribute uh, to Tim Munson, really, because he was the one who, who led the side um, in my absence for, for half the championship. And, you know, Tim Munton, there isn't a, a cricketer around with, uh, with more character, with more heart for the game. Uh, and he led the side brilliantly and, and bowled fabulously. He put in match-winning contributions, as, as well as we've mentioned Brian Lara. Neil Smith bowled people out when, when the ball turned, and Neil's had a fabulous season. And, uh, you know, the batting, likes of Roger Two's Dominic Osler, have uh, performed wonderfully well. And uh, it's been a great effort, you know, to, manage, to, to win the championship and, and to win it as convincingly as we've done is uh, a real tribute to the, to the players on the side. You mentioned Roger Two's. Now, th there seems a player who more than most has, has drawn benefit from the, the coming of Lara, shall we say. I think Roger's benefited a lot from Bob Woolmer. From, from talking cricket, uh, as well as, you know, Brian arriving. But Roger had a very good year two years ago. Uh, Roger's been, to me, is, is so unlucky not to be going somewhere with England this winter. He's uh, extremely highly rated by Warwickshire and, and by, by other county, you know, bowlers and, and players. And I have to say, at Warwickshire, we're extremely disappointed. Uh, we feel that the likes of, you know, Tim Munton, Roger Toos, Dominic Osler, Neil Smith, um, could have and should have uh, have got recognition. You know, we can't be an average team, um, but by the season that we've we've had, and uh, just to get one person on a tour is is disappointing. The Benson competition. Uh, every side needs a bit of luck somewhere in a knockout. Um, yours in the quarter final in the bowl out against Kent at Edgbaston. Yeah, um, I mean a bowl out's not an ideal way, obviously, to to decide a, a game of cricket. It was more nerve-wracking running up and bowling two balls at a set of stumps in the indoor school than it, than it was playing in a Nat West final sort of against Sussex in the season before and uh, in the end we beat Kent and eventually you know won the Benson and Hedges. Um, Warwickshire won the toss and will field. Beautifully bowled and caught Piper takes the catch. When you've got two sides like Warwickshire and Worcester that show quite a lot of depth and exciting batting strength you, you would have thought that um, the capacity crowd at Lords with uh, you know with quite a lot of spectators watching on TV that you know you would have wanted a batting spectacle you know with Brian Lara and the Graham Hicks and so on you know a, a 300 run chase you know that would be the ideal scenario but unfortunately they didn't get it right with the wicket and it, it fizzled out to be a bit of a, a one-sided affair no, I would have been very disappointed if I was a, uh, a spectator watching the first final by the time we came off from the game, um, you know, I just there was there was nothing in it. You know, I mean, it was just a matter of, of packing your bag and going. The game was the game was gone. Not not necessarily after the first two hours of it, but it was an uphill struggle from there. You can't enjoy it when you get total stuff like we did. Um, but it was very much um, uh, a problem in the sense that the toss of the coin was massive. Um, we said so afterwards. We didn't want to take anything away from Warwickshire, who played well on the day. Warwickshire win the 1994 Benson and Hedges Cup by six wickets. They don't worry about the odd mistake at Warwickshire. They don't put pressure on individuals if they have a bad day because they know that their team spirit is good enough to cope. And, they, and Dermot makes the point, that's, the thing that's probably the best thing about his captaincy. He's unorthodox, he does different things, I mean, he, he thinks of the most unusual things at times. I think there are times in, in cricket where the unconventional uh, is important and uh, people know at Warwickshire that they'll be encouraged to uh, to do that in certain situations. I mean, you, you take a shot like the reverse sweep, it's premeditated, even, even the sweep or the paddle or deciding to give yourself room. These are all decisions you make before the ball's bowled uh, and you do premeditate. And you know, coaches would say that obviously you shouldn't premeditate, you should wait to see where the ball goes before you make up your mind what shot you play. And uh, I disagree with that in, in one day cricket against certain bowlers, uh, particularly against spin bowlers. And, and we work hard at Warwickshire on on looking around at, at the, the field and trying to get the ball where the fielders aren't. And if that means getting down and paddling or reverse sweeping, then we'll do it. But the, the key is to do it straight away. If you're going to premeditate a shot, it's not a matter of, well, I'll have a little look around for two overs. And uh, we've worked very hard at that.
Trent would be the first to admit that they, they bottled it a bit. They, they, they were under pressure. They were put under pressure by Warwickshire. It was Warwickshire's out cricket that really turned the game. I mean, Kemp were, I think, needing only about 100 more runs to win with nine wickets in hand. Uh, Trevor Ward at the crease on 60, 70, or whatever. I can't remember exactly what he scored. Carl Hooper not even, he hadn't even come to the crease. Neil Taylor played very well. And then you saw a, a magnificent catch by Dominic Ostler in the deep, full, full length diving catch. And all of a sudden you could see, just, it wasn't the fact that they'd had a collapse, Kent, but just one wicket. And they all got together again, they thought, come on, let's give it our final shot. Paul Smith bowled a, an extremely good spell for, for us at the end there, which got us back in the game. And it just shows the pressure of, of cricket. If you've got new batsmen at the crease, to score at four and over, three and over even, at, at times isn't easy. And uh, if you get the ball in the right area and, and create pressure, it's amazing what can happen in cricket. And that day we, we just stuck to our guns and uh, it was an excellent win and, and a great day in front of a full house. So you had Warwickshire winning that semi-final to keep, the, keep hopes of the quadruple alive and yet in the other semi-final at the Oval, Worcester went down there to take on Surrey and had an extraordinary game of cricket down there. After lunch Tim and I sort of thought that between 280 and 290 would be a good score uh, even though the wicket in the outfield was good um, but things sort of got out of hand really. <laughs> you know we started playing a few shots and a few more shots and you know the ball was rolling our way and it, it, it's just like a snowballing effect when it goes like that and we just sort of made mayhem really. It, Beautiful stroke. Oh, that's an amazing stroke. Worcester getting 357 for two. Tom Moody, 180 not out. And they must have thought there that they were home and dry. Is that enough safe. at the Oval? Well, it nearly wasn't. <laughs> it was quite a unique game. Uh, not only with our innings, but with their innings as well. You know, it was, it was amazing that they sort of got so close at the end. You know, they needed 12 and over for the last 12 or 13 overs, which to keep that up is, you know, is an amazing feat, really, with only three wickets in hand. It was full credit to Surrey, really, you know, some of their players who sort of got them back into the game and got them up with the run rate. You know, it was an amazing effort, really. And another six. Unbelievable. Wowee. It's in the air. They caught it. Oh, it all happened very quickly and I can't, I can't really picture or remember thinking anything in particular and... You know, I just took the catch like it was a normal, you know, outfield catch and then it sunk in that that was it, it was all over, we've, you know, we've got through. But uh, I wouldn't have liked to have been five foot five on the fence, you know, <laughs> trying to catch it. In the air, got him. There was, I felt more moisture in the Nat West final wicket, uh, any one day game I've played at Lord's. Andy Moles, when he took guard and whacked his bat there, he said he was nearly bringing up water. Um, but we've got no gripes. Um, good luck to Worcester. They, they played better than us. You don't mind taking the new ball in any circumstances, particularly when the, you know, the wicket's sort of offering a little bit of assistance, and which it was doing it, it, early on, particularly the first you know, 15 overs, the, the ball was doing a lot, and it was doing too much because you know, Lara would have played and missed umpteen times. You know, to his credit, he battled through that, and uh, he posted a, a good score on a, on a quite a difficult wicket to bat on. In the end, I, you know, I felt we could have easily been 60 for six and, and game over, and, and to get 220, I felt we, we'd done well, uh, particularly having to bat at half past ten both days. We were lucky in a way that um, Tom and Graham's form really come good towards the end of the year. Tom in particular um, won the semi-final to a certain extent for us, won the man of the match there and he won the man of the match in the final, so his contribution is huge. Um, but Graham is playing ever so well and uh, he's knocking the final. As soon as he went to the wicket, really, there was every chance we were going to be strolling home. You know, I just consolidated with Graham, and then as we gained the advantage, we sort of rubbed them in the dirt, so to speak, you know, without being too cruel about it, but we, you know, won convincingly. We both wanted to be not out at the end, you know. Um, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I've enjoyed a lot of things in, in my cricket career, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was nice. I, I enjoyed it for... Um, for the other guys in the dressing room as much as, as for myself. There's a lot more noise and there's a bit more sort of, I don't know, your little high fives or whatever. I'm glad they won that toss. I think if, if Warwickshire won the toss, I think Small and Munton, I think they would have rolled through Worcester a bit. Well, that would have been a very different story. But in the end, as you say, perfect justice, Worcestershire getting revenge for the Benson's final, 
But Warwickshire very much the team of the summer. I mean, no one can take that away from them. And the way they won the Sunday League as well, at Bristol on the last Sunday of the season, Dermot Reeves saying it was you know, one of the biggest matches of his entire career, which is quite a lot. I mean, Dermot's played international cricket. He's been through a lot this summer. They've no, been a lot no one's won a treble before. before. That was it, I suppose. That was the it great was the... thing. An unprecedented treble. And although, I mean, they started, what, three for three at the start of that game, and you suddenly thought the wheels have come off. Three for three off six overs, and oh. Trevor Penny dropped on naught at exactly. the same time. And, so. and Brian Lara, a crucial 30-odd, Penny 50-odd, Dermot Reeve, of course, 50 himself. One six, no other boundaries. And I think that, that just sums up their season, because they were never going to lose from then on. Although the target looked gettable from a long, long way away, and you're never going to back Gloucester to get it. And that was, that was a good win for them. That was as, an import, as important a win for them, really, as any through the summer. Because, as you say, the pressure of the game, the pressure of the situation, was so much at stake. I mean, you can, you can argue that they'd done it all before then. It didn't really matter. That's not the case, is it? You know full well that you've got a chance in a lifetime there of three trophies. And I, I, I don't see that happening again in a hurry. I don't see it ever happening again. And now for our special review of the year competition. All you have to do is to identify the following eight bowlers correctly and you could win some really excellent prizes. So, here come the selections. 